Labvakar, mēs jau sveicināti punktu un festivāli, es ticu māk, ka ne, atskaņu pasākumā sarunā ar amerikāņu vakcinību Jesvību Bolu. Uzreiz teikšu, ka šī saruna notiks angliski, bet sākumās gribēju pateikt dažas vārdas par pasākumu un par pašu Jesvību, arī latviski. Tad saruna būs atvienu 40 minūtes par viņa dzīvi, par literatūru un droši vien arī mūsu pašu pasauli. Tā nebūs tieši piesaistīta ne punktu un festivālam, ne viņa fragmentam atkārtošanās istaba, kas šodien bija lasāma no žurnālā Jevstašinskas tulkojumā, bet es ceru, ka tāpat būs interesanti. So, now I'll switch to English and Hi, Jesse. Hello, thank you for having me. Yeah, and welcome to all to the conversation with uh, Jesse Ball. He's an American poet and prose writer, best known for his novels, including The Curfew, How to Set Fire and Why, Diver's Game, and others. Uh, he's been named among Grant's best young American novelists. The novel Cure for Suicide was long listed for the National Book Award. And his latest novel, Diver's Game, was named by the New Yorker as one of the best books of 2019. So, Jesse, uh, I've uh, had a look at quite a few of your interviews and reviews before the uh, chat. And uh, one thing that uh, keeps coming up, obviously, is that your work, your books, uh, are often being called dystopian and absurdist. And uh, what do you think of yourself? Do you consider yourself an absurdist author? Well, this dystopian as an adjective is something that sort of comes and goes, you know. In another age, dystopian might have been something that is um, uh, speculative. But now I think to write in a way that is dystopian is just a realistic writing. So um, that takes care of that. But as for absurdist, it, it also it seems perfectly natural like when you're a child your viewpoint tends to be absurdist you walk around and all that a child sees are the incongruities between um, this between that this is what adults say things are like this is what you know them to be like so i think the heart of the absurdism which i perpetrate in my books is is just that the attempting to have the gaze of a child and to look at ordinary things that way and then see how strange and you know see how many heads the horse has do you think you have this gaze of a child in your everyday life too oh certainly certainly is it uh, just something that comes natural to you i reckon i, d I don't think i can do anything about it so <laughs> if I wanted to, I could probably have a, a more comfortable life if I could not look at things that way. But I, I find it to be a joy. You know, it's mm -hmm. these, these places where you can stand in between things and sort of be patient and see what's going on, you know, as if, as if you were the furniture in the room rather than one of the participants. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, I like those places. But uh, I mean, you said that you don't consider a novel dystopian because uh, that's that's reality for you. So you wouldn't say that your outlook uh, is particularly uh, cynical or or dystopian. Well, certainly not cynical in the, the viewpoint now. I mean, I don't know about relating it to the original philosophers, the cynics. But as far as the present use of the word as being a bit jaded and a bit tired, exhausted, ab absolutely not. You know, I think there, there is a good amount of work that purports to, to write in the vein of Kafka, like in the vein of the castle or the trial. And yet that, to my mind, fails by being sort of dark in an immature or juvenile way um, because the thing about Kafka that's so wonderful is that two things are true it's both true that the world is completely bleak and there is no hope 
and you are being crushed beneath the heel of a giant shoe. And yet also within the space of that moment of being crushed, you can still participate in your life and find tiny little bits of joy as the shoe descends, you know? So I think there is, there's both no cause or rationale for having real hope about the direction of the world. And yet in day-to-day -day life, you can find joy. I think both things are true. One thing that uh, often is mentioned when I'm talking about Kafka, maybe particularly in Soviet and post-Soviet countries, is that his work is uh, also very, very funny because of the incongruities. And uh, that makes me also think of, of uh, Kurt Vonnegut, who also maybe was often uh, quite skeptical about uh, the direction the world was going, but he was also incredibly funny. Uh, do, you, do you see uh, in your own work uh, that you've been able to weave some strand of, of uh, joy, as you said, and, and some laughter? I would hope that someone would find some of the work funny. Indeed, I laugh when I'm writing it and also when I'm sometimes reading it. It can happen that I have to inform the audience that we're coming to the funny part, you know? Like it might be something, I don't know, like a Beckett-inspired passage where for, for 40 pages, somebody is repeatedly trying to get out of bed but being prevented by one thing or then another. To me, that kind of thing is incredibly funny, but uh, sometimes an audience is not totally prepared to laugh at that. I, I think when um, there are reports that when Kafka would read out loud to Max Brod and others, he would just, he couldn't even finish reading something because peals and peals of laughter would come out of his mouth and he would practically fall off his chair, tittering, but I could believe that. I certainly have missed my stop on the subway often from reading Kafka. To me, he's one of the most entrancing uh, writers. My favorite of all his things is the Josephina, the Mouse Singer. Mm. Uh, why particularly that? I reread it uh, recently, as a matter of fact, but uh, uh, I'm trying to somehow uh, make connections with your work, but probably you can do it there. Well, it, it's just the, the way that it flows. It, it, it does all the things. It's both uh, redolent of the human spirit and our idiotic ambitions as people, and then our true ambitions as people, and then also um, just so surprising the way the sentences turn and flip. And I think it's yeah, it's it's probably it's probably my favorite. I mean, the, it's hard to say anything really beats the castle. Although of all the things. There are sections in the diaries that are probably the best of everything, but yeah, there's, I had a class that I taught, which was called the Franz Kafka Fancier Society of Chicago. You know, fancier is like a word that's like, yeah. a, if you like pigeons, you might be a pigeon yeah. fancier and, and whatnot. So the Franz Kafka Fancier Society of Chicago, and we would just go to public places and sit together like in a train station, like 20 people all reading Kafka at the same time. and. <laughs> have Kafka picnics and it was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I saw in the uh, Lit Hub uh, when talking about five books that changed your students' life, lives, you also mentioned Daniel Harms, another oh. very uh, dark and very funny author. He's one of my heroes for sure. Mm. And his work is, his work is very special I think because the ways in which the basic assumptions that he makes when writing a sentence were very clear and clean and sharp and penetrate the, the way that most people see. And that continues to be true. Even, you know, a hundred years later, people, people haven't <laughs> caught up to it. So when I assign work by Deno Harms or just read them like one of the short stories, like the copper look, um, or a blue notebook, it, sometimes my students will immediately be changed. Like all they have to do is hear it once and it permanently changes them. And then they can write, you know, uh, quantitatively maybe like 15% better. 
So everyone, if you haven't read Daniel Harms, you have to go read him and he will improve your writing drastically, I promise. Uh, by the way, um, when uh, when Jordan Latvin translated Eva Lashinska, when she was reading uh, the excerpt from your upcoming book, The Repeat Room, uh, she said that it was uh, difficult for her. The main challenge was to get your prose across because she said it's very sparse and very ascetic, and that still has uh, the inner rhythm that she uh, was sometimes struggling not to lose. Uh, I think. She managed well, but uh, do you, uh, when you're writing, how do you deal with uh, with with the prose from the stand as a poet? Do you probably pay a lot of attention to the sound uh, of, of your prose? I think it's difficult. Of course, it's always, um, there are these questions of translation and how well it can be done or how poorly and whatnot. And people do like to talk about it. I think we can just feel grateful that within the human family, people can pass, you know, works from one, one language to another. And certainly I think that, especially if a work is bad, like Da Vinci Code or something, it's probably better if it gets translated, if the translator is good, you know, you would never want to read it in the original. Um, like I think the Bible is probably that way, you know, the, the, the original Aramaic or whatever is probably not very good. But as far as my, my work, the specific taste, the taste of the work in English is, well, English is a language of lexicons. You know, there are, there are so many different um, like dialects and then um, families of words that only people in certain spots in society would use. And so part of the joy of reading something that has a lot of like really thick Englishness to us is, is perceiving the way that the, the page moves between these lexicons and when a character is going to speak and then maybe they disappoint you or confuse you by switching into a different lexicon, you know, or you see like a, a father is at home with his family and speaking and then he goes out into the street and talks to someone else and you can hear the shift where he changes, like the language that he uses shifts. And I think one of the things that characterizes the, my own work is in a kind of refusal, especially of the commercialization of American language, which is you know, a process over the last hundred years that has really been absolutely completed, where this consensus English is a, like denuded garbage language that, that it's hard to feel anything when you see these commercials or, or the way that English is spoken by you know, celebrities or in Hollywood or whatnot. The, um, for me, the, the protest against that is to write in a way that has a kind of a formality, like a, an, a, a very clean, clear formality, but not usually formality denotes um, sort of aristocracy or wealth, like a snooty kind of looking down, you know, like somebody speaking in a British accent and using a lot of big words. But for me, it is more um, finding a formality where I'm avoiding the use of cliche and avoiding the, the use of these um, pre-made forms of language that are in current use. And so I would say one of the, if, you're, if, if a person speaks English like quite well, it sounds, they can't exactly tell what's weird about my language, but they can tell that it's very different from the way that most books are written. However, if you translate it into a different language and just translate the words without like really having a, a sense of this, like the fact that it lies in between lexicons and uh, it, it, I think it would be, some of that special character would probably disappear. It's an elusive character. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Uh, so do you listen to, try to listen to a lot of different people in your daily life to get these uh, lexicons to, have them be a part of your uh, wider writing lexicon. I think it's just natural. It's just being uh, just being alive and being curious and being interested. And I think, in fact, most people already possess much of it. Because if you imagine that you have a dream, like anyone, any of the people who are listening right now, you have a dream. In your dream, you might have a room full of people, like eight, nine people in a room. And each of those eight, nine people 
is saying things, each potentially in a slightly different style, each with different intonation, each with different meaning behind the things that they're saying. It's like, you know, this is the, the work, work of a great, of like Bertolt Brecht or something, you know, the work of a great playwright, except your mind can just supply this, you know? So I think the, the ear picks up and hears all these human details. It's just that our, our quest to optimize our lives and, and um, you know, pairing and uh, evolution, like, like child production and all the, the essential goals of humanity mean that to, to try to accomplish things in life, you just pare everything down. So some of the great capabilities that the mind in fact has already um, taken on and things that are natural to it are beyond the reach of people, but within their grasp. Do you think uh, it's, uh, it's been kind of processed? When you talked about uh, the commercialization of the English language, uh, do you think it has, uh, in a way, affected uh, our mind as well, the way we uh, think, the way we feel, the way we dream? It certainly can. And, but I, I think um, it can to the degree that a, a person is not having their ears like, all the way open. There's a writer named, um, thinker named Pauline Oliveros, Pauline Oliveros, who wrote a book called Deep Listening, sort of a, in the vein of John Cage, that direction of, of music and sound thinking. And part of that is to really listen as a listener to whatever is around you. And I think that by really listening, you can always subvert whatever, you know, nonsense, nonsensical sort of conformist bullshit is being thrown your way because there's always a tinge of irony and a tinge of humor, a tinge of delight. Like life is so constantly tragic that one can't help but, you know, be like crying into a handkerchief and then laughing uproariously. It's just natural. Uh, when uh, when I, the work of yours that I've read, uh, the theme to be, I think an undercurrent of, uh, of subtle anger at uh, at the world, I guess. Uh, and uh, what I want to ask was, uh, do you think it's it's possible for you to write uh, in any other way? Oh, certainly. Yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't say anger. Maybe indignation. Indignation. Mm, yeah, that's probably about what. Um, because anger anger takes its object a little too seriously. And I think that ultimately, our, um, one can hope that one's actions might lead to positive change, but one can never say which actions will lead to change and how and how they will. And so, yeah, more like a, a loose uh, indignation that pervades, and really just a, like a, like a idea of writing as a practice of witnessing and speaking, and mm. and saying because to me the um, yeah, these essential bizarreness of the character of life, when you don't need to dress it up in fancy costumes, you just need to say what you're looking at and it, and it comes out pretty, pretty strangely. So, yeah, but I have, you know, different books are, some are full of, uh, I've read sometimes books that are full of love or books that are full of grief. So many, many different shades. Uh, I remember now, uh, I recently had a chat with a Latvian author called Svens Kuzmans, and uh, his work is often uh, pigeonholed, I guess, as humorous uh, writing. And uh, he said that uh, I'm, the only thing I'm trying is not to write a humorous book. But then uh, every time I, I write, every time people read it, when they hear it spoken, they still laugh. I'm like, what are you doing? This isn't funny. This wasn't meant to be funny. <laughs> Uh, do you think it's the same for you with this uh, indignation or dystopian that people uh, see that maybe you don't necessarily want to have that? No, I, I think I think I'm satisfied with the like. I mean, it will always be the case. What you can't a, a person can't be surprised when things that would seem to be inevitable 
arrive inevitably. And so within the moment of making work, I think if work is good, it will always have a odd reception. It will never, never really be understood exactly at the moment that it appears. It takes a little while. But I certainly all over the world, you know, whether in, you know, in Japan or Bangladesh or Netherlands or uh, Argentina or Syria or wherever, there are readers who say to me, oh, this is what I thought you were doing. This is why I love this book. This is what I thought. And they're 100% correct. So I, I find myself, I just feel very lucky. And um, of course, writing is just a, a delight. I mean, I began with poetry. And to be a poet is the most marvelous of all the things in the world, you know? I mean, what, what better than to be this useless flower that blooms on a, on a rocky outcropping, you know? I think um, to be a poet is a good thing indeed, whether you publish any poems or not, you know? <laughs> Are you still writing poetry? Yes, sometimes. But do you consider now, do you, would you consider yourself primarily a poet or a prose writer? I don't think of myself specifically as a writer, but more just as a, um, I think it's hard enough to be a person. So just being a person is hard. But when I'm writing, I suppose I'm a writer. But then when I'm finished writing a book and in between until the next one, I'm like a dog walker, a supper maker, a floor cleaner, you know, all the things all the things that we can do. And uh, do you consider yourself a part of uh, any American literary tradition? Because you mentioned mostly uh, European or non-American uh, authors. Yeah, I don't, I don't care that much for American work of the 20th century, and certainly not of the 21st century. There are sometimes things, I guess, but I think the American tradition, at least in the 20th and 21st centuries, is profoundly unphilosophical and in, in a way that makes it hard for me to, um, to really fall in, fall in love with the, the work. Sometimes there's, there's some poets that can be good poets, but then those American poets are always in touch with European, um, Asian traditions. Mm -hmm. You don't really have American poets who are stuck just on American writing, but you do have entire um, like unfortunate rafts like crammed with American uh, prose writers who have only read American fiction, the poor things. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the uh, people I know from uh, from other countries, uh, readers from other elsewhere, uh, are the ones that have read your work. I think uh, the the feeling uh, of what they say about you is that you're one of the uh, few American authors uh, that uh, they uh, see as doing something different uh, in the U.S. Uh, so that makes sense. So you said that. Uh, you you look maybe outside of the U.S. more for inspiration, I guess. Well, there are, you know, there are all these different, at this point in in our um, existence as, as human beings, there are so many different mediums that you can look to for, for work, for artistic work or whatever, whatever it is that you want to look to for entertainment, for um, profound realization of, of life's truths. So you could be a person who's interested in sculpture, you could be interested in painting, you could be interested in writing, you could be interested in film, you could be interested in video games, you could, I mean, performance art, the, the music, the list is really endless. Never before has there been such a plethora of options. And so one of the things that I think character, if a book is to be characterized as an excellent book, I think it behooves that book to do something that cannot be done in a different medium. Essentially the proof of something being just like acceptable is that it can be replicated in another medium. And so 
with with writing one of the things that makes writing good and special the special character of writing is the fact that it can move between recursive layers of of thought and place and so moving jumping back and forth between seemingly transparent recursive layers of um, the to, to characterize a, like a to, to take a room and to speak about the room uh, and the person is in the room and then to leap through time to that person having been in that room you know 40 years before and then to to suddenly be speaking about the room and in the midst of speaking about the room simultaneously as it being 40 years ago and present one begins to speak about it in archetypal fashion like the properties of room itself until one is no longer speaking about like this room but about any room this is something that is very easy to do in writing but that to make that into a film would be quite quite bizarre and difficult a sculpture you know a painting very very hard and confusing you know so i think that the lack of a philosophical backdrop to american letters makes it difficult for american writers to write in the way that is the actual strength of writing and so instead what we get is an american literature that is just full of move like movie ideas like ideas for cinema and not even excellent cinema that have simply been written down what do you think is the cause of it well it's because most of those writers just watch television and film and don't read the the full tradition of books so they simply don't know what's possible with books uh, when you spoke about uh, describing the room remind me of uh, of novel by Clarice Lispector uh, I forget the name of novel but was essentially a whole novel about uh, entering an empty room and uh, Kind of tripping uh, balls off in that room by uh, looking at cockroach uh, that appears at one point and that's the only thing that happens in the novel and yeah that's something that can't really be done in any other media but um, what i want to ask was uh, when you when you mentioned all these authors that uh, have actually inspired you that are still inspiring you but which books or author do you think uh, made you want to write yourself? Well, I loved um, a book that really affected me a lot was um, The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James, which was one of my favorite ones when I was a, when I was a teenager. <laughs> And, and then also, of course, the poetry of, of Walt Whitman, especially the 1855 Leaves of Grass. I began as a poet. So for me, the beginning, I think it was mostly, mostly about poetry. There's a, there's a writer named Stephen Crane, who is an American writer, and he wrote some wonderful poetry also. So those are, and Emily Dickinson, of course, those are the American writers that I felt very close to as a, as a child. But then as far as um, foreign ones, I loved, uh, like Basho has a book, The Narrow Road to the Deep North, which I absolutely loved. And that's, um, he uses, he, may, he writes a travelogue and then punctures the travelogue with these moments of poetry, almost as though when we're um, walking with someone who's describing something and every now and then they point out a window, you pass a window and they point out a window where the, each of the, the each of the haiku is a window that one we get to, to look through. It's a really a marvelous, marvelous book. So that that one was was very important for me. And then like Irish poets in English, like um, Seamus Heaney uh, and Paul Muldoon, some of these um, these writers. But I also love I also really love the older things like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight was it was a great um, a great one for me. Even Canterbury Tales, books like this. So, but a lot of a lot of older things, I would say. I mean, I loved the, obviously some of the, the the great American writers like Hemingway, or um, but but British writers too, like Virginia Woolf, 
I, I loved very much. I like Michael Ambache. Um, mm -hmm. he, he had some some books that I, I really admired. And then Japanese writers very much, like uh, Kawabata, um, Ishiguro, Pale View of Hills. I, I loved, I think that's my favorite of all of Ishiguro's books is, is mm -hmm. Pale View of Hills. But then once I found the, like uh, Kafka and uh, absurdists like Agatha Kristoff, I just fell like head over heels for, for this, um, this tradition. And it's been, it's been with me ever since. I would say writers that I, I, I love like Sebald and Thomas Bernhard. Thomas Bernhard, I absolutely adore, you know, to the end. Of living writers, I, I like uh, Krasna Horkai very much. Mm -hmm. And also um, Fleur Jegi, I like very much. Mm -hmm. And also Alice Oswald is a British poet who's completely remarkable. How did you come across uh, Liam James as a teenager? I think my father gave it gave it to me to read because yeah. he knew that I um, there was a book maybe called the Relaxation Response or something. Like that. It was a book that was published in the U.S. about um, uh, people who had heart attacks or something with like this how to um, how to fix your cardiovascular problems. And in it, there was a breathing exercise. And so he and I were talking about this, like the breathing exercises, and he was talking to me a little bit about Zen. And then I read a book which is called The Religions of Man by Huston Smith. And that one had like parts on wonderful things like Sufism and all the all the world's religions. And then I was reading some, um, there's a book by Wapola Rahula, which is called What the Buddha Taught. And I, I love that one. And then he said, oh, well, you should also read this. William James book, Varieties of, of World's Religions. And I had read some of his brother, Henry James, who I didn't like when I was, uh, when I was a boy because I found mm -hmm. him to be like posturing, I thought. I, I think that I was wrong and Henry James is good, but at the time I, di I, I didn't like him as much. And William James, I found to be a much better writer. And what about uh, the uh, other European and Asian uh, authors that you mentioned? Because I assume that uh, they are not really mentioned very often in in the U.S. When talking about uh, contemporary or twentieth century literature, so some you... of the books that some of the books I find by reading um, reading, if I find an author that I like, like if I like, um, I don't know, let's say like. I'm reading Fleur Jaegi and I like Fleur Jaegi. And then Fleur Jaegi leads me to um, Robert Walser. And then Robert Walser leads me to um, like, uh, uh, what is that? I was just reading, oh, um, the this wonderful book, The Walks with Walser book. Did you, have you seen this one? It's wonderful. It's, um, it's, a, it's a book. I've heard about it. Yeah, yeah. Extraordinary. So anyway, you follow the path and then you look at the like reading their letters. And when when, you know, if Virginia Woolf is in love with a certain author and then you read that, then you fall in love with that author, too. So I think tracing the path through um, and sometimes artists, artists will like a really, you know, I don't know, like a sculptor like Henry Moore or something. He might have a list of like when he in an interview he might talk about what he's reading you know in, in an interview from 1960 or something and then there you can find things that are so following the path of intelligent and perceptive people speaking about what's dear to their hearts is often how i'll find books it sounds like you're a wanderer among uh, literatures of different uh, parts of the world well this is one of the freedoms that we have And uh, before, uh, before our conversation, I read uh, an interview with you in the Argentinian newspaper, Talam. And uh, there you said that uh, writing uh, is a form of self-invention. And uh, do you think you are still reinventing yourself or inventing yourself uh, in surprising ways with uh, maybe each day that you sit down to write? I would hope so. You know, I think the, the kind of reinvention that exists when you walk out onto the street and you say i have no idea who i will be today is, is something that is um, one of our human strengths so the moment that i cease to do that i think i begin to die you know 
and uh, you mentioned that you were uh, you read uh, books about Buddhism and Sufism. Uh, do you consider yourself part of any religious movement, as much as you can call uh, Buddhism or Sufism a religious movement? I mean, there are all the all of these traditions have such large population groups within them that characterizing them as uh, positive is difficult because there's so many like fools with evil intentions. You know, any, anytime you have more than 100,000 people in a group, it's going to be um, the worst common denominator out of that. But within each of those traditions, there are things that are remarkable. So I, I, do, I do feel uh, Buddhist and I do practice a kind of Zen Buddhism in, in keeping with certain, you know, there's a lineage of Zen personages who I read their, their, their you know, older works, like whether it's uh, Dogen or, I mean, Hakuin, there, there are many wonderful thinkers who've said really great things and that you can try to follow. So I do in that way. I'm a vegan and yeah, I just try to do less less harm than I otherwise would but I don't think I'm not an evangel evangelist I don't try to convince anyone else to be a Buddhist but do you think it uh, is reflected in your work anyway uh, well I think the, you would have yeah well the the absurdist outlook is is through and through mm -hmm. a Buddhist outlook so we come back to uh, where we started uh, with uh, absurdism and uh, you as as uh, an absurdist author. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, that's also a good point where we can uh, finish our conversation. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for asking for, for reading some of the work and having some fine questions for me. And thank you all who are out there listening and watching um, thank you and thank you for your time and uh, i hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the time that you have <laughs> <laughs> i'll show you yeah. cheers take care